I see I have pretty much a full house, so something interesting must be happening here today. Hopefully it's me. Um, the, um, I'd like to get a feel for who's in the audience. What's the split on, on years here? How many freshmen are here? Okay, a lot of freshmen. Okay, sophomores, sophomores? Okay, lack of interest there, obviously, so. Uh, juniors, I'd say they, need, they must need a job. Okay. Seniors, okay. Really no interest there at all, sorry guys. So, okay. All right, well, uh, it's, it's good to, uh, to have you all here, and uh, freshmen especially, because you all have been wandering around for the year, I think, wondering what do I do next? Engineering's kind of tough, should I stay, should I go? Uh, you, should, you should stay, because it's a great career. Um, I, in preparation for this discussion today, uh, looked at all the previous presenters, and, and so I really felt bad. I've never flown spaceships. I'm not building the Panama Canal, so I'm not quite sure whether I'm going to be able to offer or meet your expectations here. So I was racking my brain over what I should talk about. And I've decided to talk about me, because I know me. And I don't know to do it in a selfish sense, but I'm going to talk about me in terms of you and what you can expect to happen to you from now to when you get to be old like me and other people. And actually, it's a progression through your career where you learn every day and do different things. And hopefully, I'll convey today to you how that happened to me. Um, the, uh, the presentation will follow my life and projects as briefly as possible. And the last third or so will be Citizens Bank Park to get a feel for the Phillies projects. Uh, what I want you to take away from this discussion today is that you always have to work hard. No matter what age you are, how successful you are, your baseline should be work as hard as you can. That sets you up better for the next step, which is do more things. Um, you have to have a good time, all right? Have a sense of humor. Appreciate problems, look on the light side. No one likes a sourpuss at work, okay? So be yourself, engage, be uh, communicative, and enjoy yourself at work while you work as hard as you can and do everything you can possibly to get ahead. Um, don't let setbacks get you down. And the first part of my discussion today, after you hear about my background, is my first four years in the Navy and all the setbacks. I mean, I should have jumped off a cliff half the time I was there. But I survived and did things very well. So when you get into the business world, things happen. And you just have to deal with that and move on, chalk it up as experience, and move beyond that, okay? And then finally, once you uh, move on to a new job, a new level of play, you're, you're there because people think you should be there. You don't have to earn that job, you earned it already. But while you're there, do that job effectively and then find a way to do the next job. Always look ahead, always say, I'll handle my baseline now, I'll be effective, I'll work as hard as I can, but where do I go next? Always ask what I'm gonna do next. Because if you're satisfied where you are, you gave up, all right? Pick nothing away from today, that's the message, okay? Look beyond where you are and try to do things better and better, all right? So if you'll, uh, you'll uh, bear with me here, we'll talk about the presentation. Today's topics, uh, introductory comments, a review of my career milestones, significant projects, a little bit of discussion about project management. And project management uh, isn't just for civil engineers. Project management is involved in everything you do. I view life as a project. Things have to be managed properly. You have to know the details, the background, how effective you're being, make adjustments, move towards an endpoint, and move on. That's, that's project management. Uh, we'll talk about a few case studies, <coughs> uh, Verizon Center, United States Institute of Peace, and then uh, Citizens Bank Park. And we'll have a summary, and you have a chance to ask questions if you like. So hopefully we'll uh, get you out of the rain and give you some information that's uh, interesting and enjoyable. My personal career history, uh, Villanova Civil Engineer in 1978 was a great program for me. Uh, I was also uh, in Rossi while I was here. Uh, another good program, 21 credits a semester. But they were in good courses. They were in courses that helped me with thermodynamics, engineering, navigation, mathematics, they really were uh, uh, courses that helped me build in engineering. <clears throat> I was in the Navy for uh, four years uh, in the Civil Engineer Corps managing projects, which is, uh, again, another baseline for my future career. And then uh, chose to leave there and go to graduate school. Went to Penn State for a master's in 1983 in construction management. While I was there, I got my professional engineering license. And for all of you out here who call yourselves an engineer, you have to get that. If there's any doubt in your mind about getting it, dispel it and get it. Only because it gives you instant credibility no matter what you do. When you meet other engineers and they say they're a PE and they say, how about you? And you say, well, you, know, you shuffle your feet and look at the ground, that's a bad message, okay? So take the time while you're young, study, you know, use whatever courses your employers might offer, get it and get it behind you. It's just a thing you should absolutely get when you're an engineer. Uh, <clears throat> after graduate school, I worked for Booz Allen and Hamilton 
a consulting firm that's international, and did, believe it or not, more Navy consulting. It was a nice transition for me. I consulted on the Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base in Georgia. Um, left Booz to go to Clark Construction. At the time, it was George Hyman. Spent 10 years at Clark Construction as a general contractor and did every job in that company, from pre-construction to project management to marketing, engineering, you name it. I worked in those, in those departments. It was a very uh, fulfilling time for me and a good way to check off boxes and get things done. Uh, while after Clark, uh, one of the jobs I worked on there was the Verizon Center as the project manager for Clark. And lo and behold, the owner of the uh, Wizards hired me to run the, the job for them. So I said, adios Clark, I've got a better job. Again, my philosophy, what's the next job? And we want to become president of the arena and then manage the arena process. After we built it, they asked me to stand and manage it. So again, learning more and more. But the last thing I want to be is at a building 24 hours a day cleaning up soda. And so after a while, people started to approach me to say, would you be interested in being the project manager for this job or that job? And so I worked out an arrangement with uh, Verizon Center where I managed it part time and did their construction for them, but also started my own company. Great transition again. And then finally, since 2000 to the date, I've been uh, president of my company, Strengths Associates, where I do uh, project management, owner's representation services for owners, uh, mostly on the East Coast, but sometimes on the West Coast too. Project history. Uh, let's start out in the Civil Engineer Corps, maybe. I uh, won't, won't dwell on too much time here. Uh, this is uh, New London, Connecticut. It's uh, in the southern Connecticut, right on the uh, Long Island Sound. The uh, sub base is right in this general vicinity here. Right? Uh, a good look at sub base, from, again, from a satellite view, unfortunately. Sub base is right there. Uh, Connecticut College is there. The uh, electric boat uh, factory where they make submarines, the Trident submarines and the 688 class submarines are there. This is called the Naval Underwater Systems Center. It's another uh, naval. Uh, research facility, and my job uh, while I was stationed at Subbase was to build facilities for the Navy. I built berthing piers and dredged rivers, did all kinds of things. Um, one of the, the problems with the Trident submarine base was uh, when they calculated the draft of the Trident submarine, when it left electric boat, they left the missiles out. So they had a huge dredging project and dredged the river, and they were two feet too shallow. So one of my jobs was to go back in and dredge from the Gold Star Bridge out to the Atlantic Ocean so the Trident could get out of its manufacturing facility. I also dredged the river from the sub base down to the Gold Star Bridge under a different project. And, and dredging is kind of cool. And one of the things about dredging is it's a geometry problem. And you've got to dredge in straight lines and take up the soil and move to the next straight line and take up the soil. The way they do that is by laser, and laser range finding on the dredges. And so this little space here is called uh, Mamaco Island. That's a it's a botanical preserve for Connecticut College, and unfortunately, it was an ideal place for my dredger to set up his lasers, and then shoot down the river. So he takes his ranges in this area here to actually use his uh, clamshell buckets and, and, and dredge. Unfortunately, when he went on Mamaco Island, he destroyed the last known scrub oak in Connecticut, and so Connecticut College is mightily annoyed about that. So I, uh, one of my first jobs as a junior officer in August was to go over to the island and meet some guy who was about 95 years old who ran my butt off all over the island showing me the damaged indigenous scrub oak. You get involved in a lot of things there. We do you know, funny jobs like that. One of the other things that happened to me was uh, as I built this pier up here, which is uh, Pier 36 at, a, at the naval base, we had a, uh, a disaster happen. Uh, what you see there that's that uh, bent boom underneath that derrick that's the remains of a big Manitowoc crane who was driving piles onto the, uh, into the river for the submarine berthing pier. The operator uh, boomed forward too much. The uh, center of gravity shifted. The entire crane flipped into the river on top of the piles. The operator was thrown out into the river, came up under a supply barge. The two superintendents, who actually were heavy drinkers and were about 65 or so, came out of the trailer, had heart attacks. And so it was a, it was a good day to be on sub base for problems like that. Ended up having to go to New York City, bring up this large 100-ton derrick, and they had to come up to the river and take the, the, uh, the cranes uh, out from the pier, recover it. We had to start all over again. So that was one of my early claims to fame as a junior officer in the Navy. Again, not a success story, but, but you learn from it. Those, those kind of things happen. Um, fortunately, my boss's son drew a picture of it. <laughs> so I wanted to share that with you. It's in my office, but you know, there was, uh, there was Lieutenant Stranix. He's the one who dumped the crane in the water. Um, the colors are pretty accurate, but the crane did not look like that. It was, in, it was much worse shape than that. 
And then to add uh, insult to injury, the way you dredge rivers up there is you clamshell put it in barges and the barges are towed out to sea and they dump at dump sites. <clears throat> and so uh, one of my boats was coming back from a dump at one point and the captain was up in the wheelhouse and li listening to music or drinking coffee or something. The lights started to dim and it turns out that they lost a cooling line to the engine and the towboat sunk in the middle of the Thames River. So fortunately he was able to get it off to the side to not block strategic missile submarines from leaving the harbor, but it worked out pretty well. So, so the message here to you who are about ready to start a job is uh, life isn't perfect, things go wrong, you learn from those things, and you move on. Uh, I had a lot of great jobs in the one that was there too, but these are things that occur and you just have to deal with them and play. If you have a breakdown over this or think you've, you know, you've ruined your career, that's not true. When you're that young, it doesn't really matter when you first start in the workforce, okay? People like to see you be proactive, make mistakes, learn from them, and move on. So immediately after that, I was sent overseas in the Navy as a CB. So, so much for being in the United States and doing a cushy job. Now I'm over there uh, running military exercises in Puerto Rico. Uh, but that was a great experience, too. I was a company commander in the CBs. had 120 guys in my company. and learned a lot about leadership and management. And that's just a, a great laboratory for when you go into a new job. Because uh, you may think you're engineers now, and you will be when you graduate, but one of your primary tasks will be interacting and managing with people. All right? That's like thing number one. You all know you have friends, you see them, you assess them, you say, boy, I wonder how they're going to interact with people. It's so important to be able to convey yourself properly, speak intelligently, be a friend, help people, help everyone get forward. That's, uh, uh, you know, on top of your technical expertise, that is, uh, job number one, and that will help you quite often more, more so than your technical expertise when you went to your jobs. A project experience. Now, after I uh, left the Navy, we went to graduate school, Booz Allen hired me, um, and so one of the first jobs I worked on, again, another poor area, I, I apologize for that. This is the Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base in Georgia, and this was built specifically for the Trident submarine back in the early 80s. The previous base was on the West Coast. This is the East Coast base. Uh, this was not a great place to choose to build a submarine base, okay? This is the St. Mary's River here, and it has a siltation rate of about two feet a year. It's constantly having farmlands, agricultural materials go into the river and start to shallow the river up, and so one of the primary missions there is to dredge. And so this island here didn't exist before the base was set down there. That is all dredge spoils, all sitting in the middle of that sound, and they'll constantly add, it's probably a mountain now, if I had to guess. But this is a good transition job for me because I was able to use my Navy experience and use my engineering to begin to help them immediately in terms of programs. And so a lot of what I did was uh, early design review, uh, project management, program management, and discussions with the various parties involved to move projects along. And what that helps you do in construction as a project manager is start to understand the divergent voices that are out there and understand how everybody has to come together for a common goal. That's a very important job in project management. Uh, this is probably the low point in my life. This is the Omni Hotel in Philadelphia. Uh, I worked for George Hyman Construction at the time. Uh, I was in their, D their DC office for the first two years, and then they said, we're gonna open an office in Philadelphia. No, I'm from Philadelphia. Well, who wouldn't wanna go to Philadelphia? So we tried to transfer our Washington DC expertise to Philadelphia in terms of costing, productivity, uh, understanding what things, uh, in terms of scheduling, and we made a horrible mistake. We agreed to do a hotel for $10 million, it actually cost $13 million. And so the day we found that out, I thought I was crushed. I thought that my life was gonna end. Unfortunately, they wouldn't let me do that. I had to stay on the job all right, and try and work it through. And if you've never been in a miserable situation like that, it's the worst because no matter what you do, you never make it up. And the firm and the office all start to reflect poorly on you. And so what you try to do is you have to get through it. You have to finish the job, that's your commitment. But you hope a couple things. One, you're not gonna get fired as a result of it. And two, maybe you'll learn something out of it. And out of this job, I did. Out of this job, I learned um, that you really can't enter something just because you want to enter it so bad. Uh, at the time, Hyman wanted to be in Philadelphia so badly, they took jobs like this without thoroughly researching the market. That's why we were 30% cheaper than we should have been. Did they finish the job? Absolutely. They're a stand-up company. Was it uh, terrible? Yes. It was miserable. And my, my wife, Regina, is here. She knows for a fact I came home every night, and I, was, I couldn't be lived with. Uh, but what I, what I got out of this, though, and the sunny side was, I realized I couldn't have worked any harder at that job. It wasn't me. 
I went to work every day. I did things two and three times. Everything I did every day was on the level, just the circumstances were against me. So as an individual, and as you go out into the world, you have to assess situations and say, is this me or is this just something I'm in? And then you've got to work to make sure you do the best job you can so people recognize that. People recognized I did that here. All right? They knew as an office we made a mistake, but it didn't diminish the level of effort we put in to try and make it better and better and better. You're going to find yourself in those situations, and you need to recognize that as early as possible. You must continue to work as hard as you can to have things finished. Whether they're good or not, finishing is very important. So, so coming out of this, you know, I started to get a good feel for project management. First, the first thing was I started to feel better about myself. I couldn't have done anything better. So I, I set my incompetence aside. That's maybe not a good thing to do, but at least I did it then, okay? Um, but I started to think about what's, what's project management. What I began to understand is project management is everything. If you have a project, whether you're responsible for elements of it or not, you need to know what comes first, what comes second, what finishes up, and how they all interact. It's a big continuum. You cannot ignore things you're dependent on. You cannot shirk things people are dependent on you for. So that whole continuum is very important in project management. You guys have worked in groups, right? Isn't that hateful? All right. Life after college is one big group. All right. You got to get along with people. Um, project management scope is important. Project management, everything is in your scope. Okay, because everything impacts that environment. You have to have materials there on time. You have to have people understanding process, schedule on time, people paying attention, attention to quality control. Know what owners want, know what subs want, know what your people want. Project management involves the entire project. And these are overly simplified, but they're, they're not. They're actually quite complex com uh, concepts. The skills required, um, you can't be an introvert, okay? You've got to be willing to engage people and confront people in a, in a beneficial way. Not confront them in a way that says, you really screwed this up, and so I'm blaming everything on you. The issue is, this is a project. We collectively have to solve this problem. I don't care if you made a mistake and you're wrong about it. Roll your sleeves up, let's finish the job. That's what it means in terms of being uh, the skills required. You've got to be able to adapt, change, and then bring things together so they finish. Not finishing isn't an option in project management. I know a lot of bad projects, and they all finish. You just can't be discouraged about that. You have to get finished and be done. The project management role during the project life cycle, for me, since I involve, I'm involved with owners from the beginning through the very end of projects and through operations, the, uh, the scope and role involves everything. I bring teams together, I ask the right questions. You want to make sure whatever you need is in the pipeline that's coming. Your role is to be a synthesizer. You're going to bring everyone together and make sure that you communicate information to everybody, they communicate back to you, and tell everybody what you know. Holding back information is the death of a project manager. All right, there's, no, there's nothing to be gained by keeping secrets. It's the end of the world. And then finally, uh, jobs are successful when everyone's successful. Right? It, uh, your own success, should be secondary to the team. Uh, generally, in project management, um, you really want to make sure everybody does their job, can be dependent upon, and knows what their job is so they're not standing there with their hands out and their shoulders uh, hunched. It's a, it's a matter of making sure that you do truly work as a team, spread work out, and talk about things that uh, need to be done and get resolved as soon as possible. Nothing in project management gets better with age. Nothing goes away. Or you can hide things for a while, but God help you when the guy you work for finds out it's been hidden for two or three weeks. If you know something's wrong, raise your hand. Right? Say it right away. I, I know you guys are accomplished now. You've been here for three or four years. Some of you, some of you are freshmen. All right, when you get out of college, you'll have a great baseline in academics. You're not going to know a lot about the, the world of projects and, and management. You're there to learn. That's your next level of learning. Another project I was involved in um, with Clark this is McCormick Place in Chicago. Does anybody know about it? Anybody from Chicago? All right. It's, it's an enormous building. Enormous. That white building, what I was involved in is uh, the initial building there. Oh, sorry. This is the initial building. That was the original McCormick Place. It was damaged in a fire. Uh, when I got involved, this wing had just finished. And the, the authority had had a horrible problem with that. They bid it uh, competitively for a guaranteed maximum price, uh, which means that the proposing team agreed to, fix it, to uh, build a certain scope for a fixed fee, and they had nothing but absolute problems. There were claims against the architects, claims against the government. It was an absolute disaster. I think it was probably $40 million over the initial price tag. So when it came time to do uh, McCormick III here and this bridge on, on 23rd Street, they elected to do it under a design-build program. Design-build means you bring one entity on board, and they're responsible for design and construction. And the concept was that that entity has no one to blame but themselves. 
They can't be suing the architect and vice versa. So they looked for a self-contained developer design contractor firm. Uh, for some reason, uh, when I worked for, for uh, car construction, they thought I had the capacity to go out and represent the firm as the, as the contractor leg of the design build entity. I didn't know any better. I thought I could too. So they sent me out there during the procurement phase to actually help generate the proposal, and generate the logic, and, and win the job with all the Clark resources. So in my own profession, my own background, I got a great feel for how groups work together in that regard. We had a developer, we had a design team, I had my construction team with joint ventures, and that was a great uh, educational process for me. I, I broadened my experience and built on what I knew before. Again, looking to see the next thing. To give you an idea of scale, that, that building is 30 acres. It is enormous. The entire uh, McCormick Place complex, this building and that building there, is about uh, 60, 70 acres. And it is the largest contiguous floor in North America, I believe. They have, they have enormous shows out there. But this was a great learning experience for me. I managed the design build process during the procurement, uh, kept the team together. I acted like I was in charge. I didn't, they didn't know any better. The people I worked for, you know, thought I was just good old John. But in terms of me taking on that responsibility, what's helpful was a career development path. Verizon Center. Anybody from Washington? Okay, good. So I'm, I'm a Philadelphia native, but I've been, we've been in Northern Virginia for the last uh, 25 years or so. Uh, when I was, went back to Bethesda to work for Clark, they made me the project executive on the Verizon Center. Because it was a design build project, I had design build experience in, in Chicago. And so my job was to manage the design build team and manage it for both uh, George Hyman Construction and Ellery Beckett, who was our designer at the time. Uh, this is a picture of it, more or less as it stands today. It's, a, it's an urban arena, not like uh, the uh, first union center here, or the, I guess it's Wells Fargo now. It's in the middle of a uh, five acre site in downtown DC. And the interesting thing about it is not too dissimilar from, let me go back to uh, the McCormick Place. One of the things that helped me on McCormick Place was, I meant to mention this, there's a rail line that runs right down the middle of the building. That's the Chicago Metro line. That's their local regional railroad. Uh, I've got bridges to build here. I'm building next to water. I have all kinds of uh, water problems. So I learned a lot in the corner place. It turns out it's very applicable to Verizon Center. Verizon Center is built in the middle of downtown DC in contaminated areas, much like the corner place is contaminated. It has rail lines next to it. It's a very complex project. So those skills were immediately transferable to this job. And as you, as you begin your careers and do more work, you're going to find you can employ things you learned on previous jobs continuously in your next jobs. This is a, uh, unfortunately not the clearest uh, uh, plan in the, in the world, but this is the lowest level of Verizon Center that's going to give you some idea of the complexity of this arena. Uh, this is the south of the building. That's a parking garage for about 120 cars. That's the lowest level of the building. You gain access to that garage by going through this tunnel uh, over the metro line, up a line to 6th Street. So there's a huge tunnel to get down to that, but you've got to travel under an ice floor over a metro tunnel, and there's, no, there's probably about three feet of clearance between the tunnel and the ice floor down to the parking garage. In order to build over top of the metro tunnel, we built these transfer girders. Every one of these gray shapes is a transfer girder that carries a load over and around and down beyond the tunnel. They all had to be engineered too by my design build team. This area here is the train room from the uh, Gallery Place station in DC next to Verizon Center, and that goes right into this large tunnel here. This tunnel is the uh, orange line that runs north-south uh, on 7th Street. This tunnel is the blue line. So we had a confluence and convergence of two subway tunnels. We had contaminated soils. We had almost no site to build. And we had a very restricted urban atmosphere. These tunnels here are air relief tunnels. You may or may not be familiar with this, but when subway trains rush through tunnels, they push an enormous amount of air in front of them. If that was allowed to come into the train room, people would be blown off the platforms. And so what they do in subway stations is they build an interception tunnel that relieves that pressure and it goes to the surface. That's why, if you remember the old movie with Marilyn Monroe's dress being blown up, that's a relief vent. That's the train rushing through the tunnel. So this is a, this is a very complex job, even before you got anywhere beyond the first, the first level. Uh, it's an idea of the initial part of the site. When we first started this project, we were supposed to find 15,000 tons of contaminated soil out of about 300,000 tons. As we continue to... Uh, to work through the site, what we found out was that when they demolished the previous two and three story buildings that were there, there was no environmental protection agency. There was no remediation of buildings prior to the demolition. 
They collapsed the buildings. They had oil tanks in them. They squashed 1,000 gallons of oil right into sandy soil. And so what happened was every property had a huge plume of, of oil going down all the way to the bottom of the excavation. So it was almost impossible to try to excavate clean soil and dirty soil. Now, the District of Columbia was responsible for excavation, site remediation, and also the Metro Rail Line work in the station itself. It turns out back then they had no money. This is in 1994. That was at the low point for DC. We were the first thing to come back into DC. So what the, the nice thing about construction projects is after the bank rakes you over the coals before they'll give you the money to do the project, once they give you the money, they're in trouble. Because the only thing that helps them is if you finish the job. And so while we didn't anticipate these costs, did not anticipate DC being bankrupt and being unable to do their part of the bargain and clean the soils up, the bank still recognized we had to clean the soil up. And so what the bank allowed us to do was go in there and play the role of DC. They would give us the money to fund the remediation while DC got their act together to be able to create, uh, establish more funds. So it was a very complicated project. And I only say these details to you because life for us as engineers is more than engineering, okay? I don't think I've said one thing other than transfer girders to you guys about engineering, but it's all circumstances, it's all people, it's all team, it's all getting together. You're gonna find your life is more complicated by that than knowing uh, loads somewhere or figuring out a moment, okay? It's the things that affect that that you've gotta to learn to master. So everything, everything you see there is covered in plastic, that's all contaminated soil. This is where that uh, metro line runs through, all right? And north of there is the other part of the arena. Uh, more of the same, uh, the area here, we're starting to do sheeting and shoring on this side, excavations, still have not demolished these buildings. And we have these, uh, the, the street is still in place, that's, uh, that's G Street, which we eventually vacated. Uh, better shot of the site, now you see those buildings are knocked down over there. Uh, you see these massive concrete pieces here? They're the transfer girders. They were all set in place and poured. There's another edge sticking up right there before we could do the event floor of the arena. All that stuff has to go in as infrastructure, all that sort of planning, all that sort of, the, of construction management. You'll also see here the start of the tunnel from the street, from 6th Street, down there, left turn, over to the parking garage. Uh, a little more advanced in the project. Here we see the uh, parking garage is built. This is, this is the entire parking garage. This is actually the Wizards practice court. This is a play and practice facility. There's a full-size practice basketball court in this facility, even though it's only five acres. It's a very small arena as arenas go. And then you see the tower crane starting to be set up for the uh, concrete work and in future structural operations. Sheeting and shoring on both sides. I'm not sure you can see this or not, but remember we have a metro tunnel here and a metro tunnel here. Uh, you cannot have tiebacks. If you've had foundation classes, I think you probably all know about tiebacks, right? They hold sheeting and shoring in place with dead men, they're drilled in, they hold the sheeting in the vertical position. You can't drill into a metro tunnel. And so what you end up having to do in sheeting and shoring situations like that is to build these kickers in there. See those diagonal beams that come back and braces? They keep the beams in place from inside the hole. They complicate your life, but there's no puncturing uh, outside utilities or, or uh, metro tunnels. It was also an interesting job because it's, a, it's an urban site, so all of our trailers are all hung off the side of the sheeting and shoring right there. Another shot of the more progression. Um, the, uh, you see the north side of the bowl and the south side of the bowl progressing. This is a, the full event floor now that's been finished. And this gives you an idea of how complicated on a five acre site it can be for a $300 million project. Uh, ringer cranes, tower cranes, all kinds of crawler cranes. Very active job site. This is uh, probably, we, uh, the, the contaminated soils I mentioned to you guys held the job up six months. That's how hard it was to finish the job. The job was supposed to be a 24-month project. We ended up making up three of the, of the six months and opened the building in early December. Uh, but um, this picture here, just to give you a, an idea of how frantic these jobs are, probably took place in April of that year. That's how, that's how much work still had to be done to finish the job in time. And what happened is, if you could see, this is a, a set of four shoring towers. This truss was assembled on the ground on the event floor, and that big ringer crane lifted up and put it on top of those shoring towers. And then those, that, once that box was in place, each progressive section of that truss was built cantilever, side to side, in balance. So you could do it all the way till you reach bearing. The only bearing for this truss, this truss bears here and bears there. In the meantime, those shoring towers are in place 
while you uh, construct the rest of the truss. Now, again, the, the, uh, the bed like I have, <coughs> while we're doing this, there's a small fire hydrant right there, and one of the dump trucks we had backed over it, and we had a 60-foot geyser of water in the air. Where did all the water go? Into the hole. So the water filled the parking garage up and started to compromise the footings of those shoring towers until we shut it off. Unfortunately, DC couldn't shut the water up for probably about three hours, just enough to fill the entire hole up. So it's just one more thing, you know? You, you can't panic. It happened. I couldn't have stopped it. My staff couldn't have stopped it. You roll your sleeves up, get back on the horse and ride again. That's what you do. Uh, Corcoran Gallery of Art. I've had a, a pretty wide variety of jobs in, in, in my time. Most owners I work for are people who don't build frequently, but they're smart people and they get, they get the concept. They know they need somebody and they're willing to play a role in this. Uh, for the Corcoran, it's a building that was built in the uh, late 1900s, early part of the 19th, 1900s. It was a, a flag and plat where the architects and uh, the Corcoran decided to have Frank Geary design an addition. And so this is the Geary addition to the Corcoran. You can see it matches pretty well. Um, and so, so the Corcoran needed someone to manage their project and they, they heard about me and, and so I went over and talked to them about it. Generally just to explain to them what they're probably getting into and before he knew it, I left the meeting and they asked me if I would be their manager for them. So uh, I said yes and so we embarked on this project um, to build this addition while they were raising funds. They had enough money to raise funds for the design and anticipated once people saw the brilliance of the design, money would come pouring in. And at that point, Frank Geary, and he still is, is a very hot commodity and he more or less attracted money. This was probably a $150 million project and uh, they raised about, uh, I'm going to say $90 million by the time we were ready to start construction. We'd already paid $16 million for the design and then there was a uh, dot-com bubble burst in D.C. and everyone who had a lot of that $90 million took it away. And so the Corcoran had to shelve this project and it went away. We had full construction documents. We were ready to build. Just, that just happens. That's what happens in, in some of project management. I still work for the Corcoran. I've been there since uh, the late uh, 90s and still do work for them. Now they're in the process of selling it to GW University and National Gallery of Art to try and make themselves a more viable process. So things happen in project management. That was a really remarkable project. We went to uh, uh, Germany for the metal panels. We went to Spain to pick stone. We were ready to go. And just uh, with no funding, things don't happen. <clears throat> uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. This is in, uh, it's at uh, 23rd Street and Constitution Avenue in D.C., right next to the Kennedy Center. Again, it's a headquarters building uh, that's on a, a monumental piece of property. And again, someone heard about me and said, Would, you know, can you talk to us about the process? And you know, for some reason when I talk to people, they think they want to work with me. So they uh, also asked me to come work for them. And so we got involved in designing this building. And this is an interesting building. This is up 23rd Street in Constitution. This is 23rd Street. Constitution goes down here. Kennedy Center. Uh, this is a Naval Observatory here. A State Department's up here. This is not a big building. This is probably a, a, a 225,000 square foot building. It's essentially a cube that's been sliced and with the three pieces moved apart and then created two atriums, and then this roof, which is a, uh, a glass and steel structure, a very thin membrane roof, was applied over the atrium. Um, so uh, the, uh, one of the problems with doing customized roofs and curtain walls is there's no testing been done. So one of the things we had to do was, first we had a design-build competition for the roof itself, and the firm that won that was a firm called Sealy out of Germany. And then they had to actually build mock-ups in place in Germany that had to be tested for water infiltration and air infiltration. So what you see here is a full mock-up of a roof section. It's a relatively complicated portion and a full mock-up of the curtain wall section. And this is an airplane engine. And all the piping you see that's surrounding that uh, mock-up there, they're all water nozzles. And they're meant to simulate driving rain under pressure. And so the way you test a new assemblies that have not been done before is you build a mock-up and you try to blow water through it. And we did this for about a week in Germany and learned a lot of things about this uh, assembly, how to build this model, how the curtain wall has to tie in, and fixed a lot of problems in the field before they came to the United States. That's generally how you do complex projects like this. Again, just as, as a matter of perspective, this is me talking about you and your future jobs and things you learn over time. Could I have done this out of college? No. Okay, but what I learned progressively over time, as you will learn, helps you tackle problems like this and get people together and then uh, work with the people who are specialists to make sure you come up with the right solution. The way this was built internally was, and this is uh, 
inside the primary atrium of the arena, of the, uh, the, the, the uh, USIP, each one of the, and it's hard to tell because this has an underlying membrane on it. This is made up of a uh, rectangular tube section that's probably about four inches by eight inches. That's actually bent uh, in Germany. Then it's assembled in lattices, more or less like this. And they're shipped by container to the US and they're assembled on site. But again, they're not uh, uh, stable uh, integrally. They've gotta be supported before they're tied together so they become stable ultimately. So each one of these ladders that can't get shipped over was supported by this false work. Laid on top, uh, measured properly, bolted together, and then once it became stable, you could take all the scaffolding down. And so that entire roof was all supported by this scaffolding and it became down progressively over time. That was a great project and the, the Germans did a phenomenal job uh, working with the designers to actually produce this roof. As a project delivery uh, method goes, another way we could have approached this was the designer, Moshe Safti, could have designed the roof in a vacuum based on how he thinks roofs should go together. We could have put that out for bid. We could have three bidders come back to us and tell us we can't build that roof because Moshe Shafti has no idea how to design a roof. So to cut that corner and save time, we went out with a design assist proposal. And Safti put a concept together that went out in a RFP format. And the concept was that the firm's capable of doing this, and there's probably three in the world, come back with a proposal for design and construction. And that way you get the shape you want, the geometry you want, and you get a design that works without wasted time. So that, that was a very effective process as we went forward. Citizens Bank Park is a, a, an icon locally, some, some applause there. This was a great job for me. <clears throat> um, I had done Verizon Center, which is a sports job for me, but also it, it allowed me to come back to Philadelphia and work for a team I really cared about. And it, just, it was a great, rewarding personal experience for me. Great job, we'll talk more about that later on. Uh, while I built that for the Phillies, they were also building a new spring training facility in Clearwater and needed someone to build that. So we expanded our staff and built this simultaneously with Citizens Bank Park. This still exists today in Clearwater. It's a relatively new facility. Uh, baseball circles are, are fairly small. And so uh, when the Nationals came to DC, um, it was initially being built uh, by the District of Columbia at their expense for Major League Baseball before they awarded the ownership of the team. Uh, so ultimately, the Nationals were awarded to the learners. And the learners, if you're from Washington, DC, you may understand, they're developers. They understand design and construction. And so the dynamic down there was that you had a city building a ballpark that didn't want to spend any money on it. You had Major League Baseball who only wanted the maximum value for a franchise when they sold the, arena, the, the building to the learners. And you had the learners who live, eat, and breathe development and design and construction. So their hands were essentially tied. They could put their own money into it if they wanted to, and they actually did put about $75 million into it with improvements. Um, but there was a lot of distrust amongst the project team. Uh, no one trusted the city to build it. No one trusted that L.R.B. Beckett would properly design what the Nationals wanted. And so my role, I was brought in to work for the Nationals to try and keep people together and try and make sure that the ultimate project got the Nationals' desires built into it and became a facility they wanted to use. So it wasn't my normal role, but it was, it was, a, it was a good role to be involved in. Dodger Stadium, uh, finished that up uh, last summer uh, with a woman named Jana Marie Smith. She was the person who was the project manager for the Orioles' Camden Yard. She kind of broke the mold in terms of this, this work. Uh, the Dodgers hired her to uh, oversee their work for them. She reached out to me to help her do the project management on Dodgers. Dodgers, if you haven't been out there, <coughs> it's just an iconic ball field. It's a great ball field, one of the last of the uh, old ones. But um, in the old days, no one cared about teams. And so locker rooms were about the size of a bus station. They were just miserable, terrible, smelly, dank places. Dodgers was a miserable, terrible, smelly, dank place up until about a year ago. It's almost, a, and we, we did all this work in the course of an off season, okay? We ended up taking off the entire lower bowl back to the main concourse, getting rid of all the seats, all the treads, all the risers, exposing the entire footprint of the building, and then building an entirely new uh, service level, which had a state-of-the-art uh, locker rooms for the Dodgers, the visiting teams, and everything you expect with a new ballpark. Put back the new level, put back the new seating, had it open for opening day. Great job, very difficult to do, but it was a really spectacular project to work on, so you, you were involved. And finally, I do other things in sports projects. This is United Therapeutics. It's a uh, pharmaceutical building. We've probably done four phases down there, including pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities. Again, I say this to you because the vocabulary of project management is not specific to one type of project. You run into the same problem. So don't feel you're restricted to different projects because you're a project manager. You can do almost anything once you've seen a project run successfully. 
and also do university work. Marymount University, this is a complex project for them. Residence hall, academic facility, parking garage. That's in uh, Northern Virginia. <coughs> Citizens Bank Park. This is a project we'll, know, we'll, we'll talk the most about. Uh, we, we finished it in uh, 2004. Uh, great project, still a great ballpark. Uh, the Phillies are a dynamic, great organization. <coughs> Excuse me. Commercial break. Sports complex. Um, <coughs> New Phillies ballpark, situated right there. Uh, this is the old uh, Vet Stadium down. The Spectrum's gone now, I know you're all familiar with that. <coughs> this is the, uh, I think it's the Wachovia Center now. It's had many different names. Uh, Eagles, and this is the, uh, used to be the Acme uh, Frozen Warehouse. And now it's, uh, this half of it is the Jetro Warehouse where it's kind of a uh, commercial, uh, um, you know, uh, high volume food place. Running through the ballpark, the ballpark in this instance it's probably about 12 acres. So imagine you could fit four of these in that building I showed you in Chicago. That's how big that building was, enormous. It gives you an idea of the size of the property. This just shows all the outside areas, the access points, parking garage, truck marshalling areas, uh, food and commissary. Lowest level of the building, this is the business uh, aspect of the building. Uh, receiving, uh, this is uh, something to remember for, for the future, okay? This is a primary electric and primary mechanical. This runs the entire building. Uh, the Phillies home locker room. This is a uh, driveway where you can drive equipment trucks all the way around the building, all the way to the end here where the visitor's locker room is. And this is a utility tunnel that allows you to have uh, complete circuiting utilities throughout the entire building. You know, just dead end. You can backflow where you want to. It was uh, pretty essential. This element of the building is probably 15 feet below the water table. Uh, that's how far the ballpark is into the existing groundwater down at the, uh, the site. Next level up is the main concourse, the, the part you're all mostly familiar with. Circular concourse, Ashburn Alley out here, playing field obviously, premium seats. This building here is uh, the uh, uh, bar is there. You've got the Phillies offices over here. This is just ramps essentially in the team store and ticketing area. This is the business end of the building. That's where the commissaries are. That's where the, uh, a lot of the workers locker rooms are and the offices are. Cross section of the building to give you an idea. This is directly behind home plate. Uh, this shows a, uh, a service area down there. This is the, uh, the uh, high-end lounge right behind home plate. <clears throat> this is the main concourse with the, con with the concessions on the outside. Um, suite seating, uh, club seating, and also uh, the uh, upper concourse and offices. Now, when you, when you go to, to build a ballpark, the question was asked to me earlier today, how do you, get up, how do you come up with these designs? And, and what you do is you, you copy everyone else's design. Right. And that's well known in the industry. And so one of the first things you do is you travel to every possible ballpark you can. It's very collegial and you take every picture you can. And you try to identify what the better aspects are, what the worst aspects are, what do you like, what do you like about distances, feel, paint, textures, rooms. One of the first decisions you make in building a sports facility is bowl cross section. This isn't like you're building an office building where you have a ground floor and 30 floors. It's very particular how you want your seats located because they sell differently. Here, for instance, lower bowl, piece of cake. Okay, the only problem with lower bowls is if this angle is too shallow and no one can see, everybody hates you, right? You have to have a, a solid sight line. The next thing that's a big quandary for owners is where do you put the suites and where do you put the club seats? Because they're both, you know, potentially high uh, profit areas, but you don't want them to be situated where no one will buy them. Uh, the Phillies, after visiting many ballparks, elected to put their high-end suites right above the main concourse. If you've been there and seen these suites, they're phenomenal. They had no problem selling these suites, just tremendous suites. Many ballparks, uh, Nationals for instance, uh, Colorado, others, tend to put the suites higher than the club seats. They view club seats as more of a value. It turns out people aren't gonna pay extra money to sit in the club seat because they get a free cup of coffee. If people want good seats, they want to pay for them, but they don't want to be somewhere and get charged amenities they don't really care about. And so, over time, what people have found is the club seats don't sell as well as suites or other premium seats with, that are, are less pricey with less uh, elements that are attached to them. And then finally, you have this uh, upper level concourse up here, which is uh, not a bad seat. I mean, in terms of the vet, the vet bowl shape probably went out here. 
So all the new ballparks are denser, higher, and closer to the playing surface. This is suite level, gives you an idea of the suites that are there. Generally, if you remember the vet, all the Philly suites are in the outfield. So, I mean, what good is that? In the, in the, uh, in the new ballpark, one of their goals was to have all the suites in the infield. And as you see, generally it's through all in fair territory. Not all in the infield, but all in fair territory. These are upper levels of the buildings that are outside. This is the uh, Philly's office space. This is commissary again, uh, dishwashing, food preparation, locker rooms, and again, more ramps to get up and, back and down to the, the building. Uh, this is the club level. Uh, again, club seats. A very large enclosed club amenity here if you've been there. Uh, many in interior con concessions with higher end food. Nice places to sit, get out of the cold weather. It turns out to be a nice place. Again, tough sell. But the Phillies realize that. And so rather than make the entire level a club level, they let regular patrons sit out here. And so you get the same great seats without paying for the amenities. And they found it to be very attractive for people. So a lot of what they did in their design was make sure they matched seats with their projected profile for sales. And again, I'm not talking about engineering here, guys, okay? This is stuff I pick up through osmosis or being in meetings, and these decisions and knowledge drive design. And so when a design team asks me or someone asks me why are we doing that, I have background to talk to them about it. And so as you do more of this kind of work, if you choose project management, you have to be a sponge. Pick things up and be able to use it effectively in the future. Uh, upper level seating plan. Uh, this is an upper level set here, but this set off to the side is actually lower than this set. So these, are, even though they're in the outfield, they're closer to the field. So the Phillies did that intentionally to make these seats more saleable. So they seem like they're not upper deck. There's a little bit of an advantage, even though they're not in the infield. And again, these are more your, your more traditional upper level, upper level seats. This is a section down the line just shows a little different section of the ballpark. So managing the project. There, there are millions of people involved in projects like this, and they all are out for themselves. And so the job of a project manager, and not in a bad way, they're out for themselves because that's what they're supposed to do. They have jobs. They're supposed to report to people and do what they're supposed to do effectively. It's bringing people together as a team is the talent of project management. In this particular instance, these are the people who are stakeholders in this process. I dealt with these people throughout the entire project in different ways and different forms. But you have the Phillies, uh, which is the organization that's paying for everything. This is their ballpark. Ewing Cole HOK, which HOK is now called Populous. That was the joint venture design team. They had 15 subconsultants working for them as part of the design team. <clears throat> the construction team was Driscoll and Hunt Corporation. Hunt has built most of the sports facilities in the country. That's why Driscoll brought them together. That joint venture was intended to use Driscoll's local knowledge of the industry and trades and Hunt's knowledge of baseball. Unfortunately, it worked to be the opposite, so it had to be a little, a little bit of a problem once in a while. But in any event, they did a good job. They had 70 subcontractors working for them. Again, each of these individuals are individuals. They want what's best for their company. So you're going to conduct this huge symphony as a project manager. Then we have the city and their project manager, because the city is invested in this project, and they can't do it by themselves. They have to have their own entity managing their aspects of it. You have the state and their project manager, because they're contributing money, too, and they have to have someone watching over your shoulder there. You have the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, who is tasked with managing the entire project for the city. You have the Eagles, who can be a good and bad neighbor because they're across the street and building their, their stadium at exactly the same time, using some of the same subcontractors with different pressures at the same time. Sorry, it's not over yet, okay? You have the community who varies from hating you to loving you, depending on what you're offering. If you have free tickets, I'm everybody's friend, okay? If I happen to put, push dirt into someone's backyard or wake their dog up at night, I'm Jack the Ripper. So it's a very difficult thing to manage. You have disadvantaged businesses and labor. Obviously, the city has a, a social obligation to incorporate disadvantaged businesses. They've got to be into the mix. Uh, labor unions in Philadelphia, be all and end all, okay? They dictate terms because they're the labor. You have to work with them. Not so in other parts of the country, but it's a, it's, it's a business effort. That's what happens in Philadelphia. Suppliers and vendors that support your team and support the construction team. Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball plays a huge role. In this case, they've got to accept the building. They lay out their standards. They come down and inspect it. They tell you how it has to be. So they're kind of the, uh, you know, the, the huge gorilla at the end of the job that tells you whether the foul pole's in the right place or change these lines. Uh, they have a say eventually. The concessionaire. Uh, teams make a fortune off of food. I'm sure you know when you pay twice for something why you're paying that money, okay? That's just the way the business operates. But if they don't have the right mix of uh, soft drinks, beer, pretzels, hot dogs, fast food, spaghetti, you name it, 
They're not going to maximize their profitability. They're unhappy. You're unhappy. You make less money. Uh, the fans, don't forget the fans. You guys have to be happy, okay? And the Phillies are c very concerned about the fans. They built this ballpark to make sure people want to come to it, and people do. Uh, and finally, we had retail spaces because we had uh, you know, a bar there, we have a store there. They have to identify their needs too. So you, know, you see two pages here of people who I'm going to deal with and interact with at some point during the project, often together. Uh, I'm sorry this isn't any clearer to you, okay? This is my hand scrawled project organization for my team. And this tells you what I had to do to manage my side of the fence, notwithstanding the previous two pages, okay? So this is the Phillies who I work for. This is me. I've got my own administrative and financial people who keep track of all the money and keep track of paperwork. Then I've got a design manager. I have a construction manager. They have project engineers. And then they need design and construction support as needed to help us make decisions. So I have to go out and get additional vendors. I've got uh, structural consultants, inspectors, voice and data. Voice and data is like black magic. It's, it's gone from having copper wires tied to old telephones to being run on fiber optics and being very sensitive to light and, and humidity. You may not be studying that now, but you're going to find out about it in the into the real world. Um, I've got the television people. Television is a huge revenue issue for baseball. Scoring, scoreboard testing, mechanical electrical consultants. All these people work for me aside from those two pages. Now, in the boxes to the side, I have special support that I need, all right? One plus all these other people. I've got to know legal, zoning, public relations, city services, utilities, expediting, community, EEO, ADA. ADA is a huge impact on how stadiums are built in all buildings today. Uh, transportation management, retail, FF&E. Uh, once you build the building, it's not finished. You've got to fill it with something. Loose chairs, equipment. That's fixtures, furnishings, and equipment. Uh, that's in my box, too. I think beyond that to make sure it's there on time. Um, you've got pre-opening inspections. You've got insurance, parking, training. All these in the, in the special support side. The Phillies provide a lot of that expertise, but we also have to have people outside the agency, all of them coordinated by my office. On the uh, operations supply, supply, these are all operational support, concessionaire has to be involved, security, when does security come into the building? How do you run your TV operations? When do you bring operations into the building? When do the facility managers show up? This is a continuum, that's project management. So if, if you thought about project management in the past, it's kind of like, that's the guy who you know, checks the invoices and says it's okay. The broad aspect of project management is really fascinating. You really get involved in everything, and you have to run the project. You are the project. That's what I like about it. Financing for the project is about a $500 million project, $100 million from the state, $100 million from the city for the ballpark, $100 million for, uh, the, from the city for demo and infrastructure. And the bottom line, the most important line there is balance from the Phillies plus risk of overruns. So in, in D.C., the nationals weren't responsible for overruns. They didn't care. We didn't care. The city owed us a ballpark. Here, every time the Phillies went beyond their budget, it came out of their pocket. It really gets your attention. And this is probably one of the better ways for municipalities to run these projects, assuming their teams will accept that responsibility. The contracting approach we use was a uh, negotiated contract, bringing the contractor on board early with pre-construction services, which means they're with you while you design the project and they're constantly pricing and costing to make sure your costs stay within your budget, leading to a guaranteed maximum price, which theoretically, as long as there's no change orders, means that's the number. No more, no less, they do everything. It was fully open booked and auditable, so all the contractor is uh, guaranteed is his fee and some of his costs. The rest of it we can check and audit all the time. And finally, if they saved any money in their contract, we shared it with them. They were entitled to some of the share of the savings. That's a fairly typical contracting approach for this kind of work. The design process, how this took place was we engaged the design firm with ballpark expertise. You don't want people practicing on ballparks without ballpark expertise. It's just a, a, it's a disaster. So that's why HOK was involved. HOK has probably done most of the ballparks in the country. Uh, but you also want a local design and engineering firm because HOK doesn't understand what Philadelphia requires. You don't want HOK bumbling around trying to do things that the local codes won't allow. The, uh, the ballpark research we talked about earlier, visiting ballparks, essential to make sure that what you design uh, is what you wanted to have to begin with and is satisfactory at the end. Very involved, very, very uh, specific. Philly's input. The Phillies can't say, build me a ballpark and go away and come back and complain about it. They've got to be with you every step of the way, and they were. They were a very engaged owner. 
the ballpark conceptual design is very important because that sets the design in stone. You can't have a conceptual design, go off and do schematics, design development, and then say, you know what, I don't like that. You would have spent four or five million dollars and you wasted it. So it's very important to have the concept people like, you buy into it, and then that becomes set in stone and you build on top of that. That's the process. And finally, uh, you complete, sorry, you complete design packages according to the construction schedule needs. So we didn't have the luxury of time to actually design the entire project, price it out, modify to meet our budget, and then build the project. We were building this building before we had final numbers. That's how confident the Phillies were, but also how anxious they were about getting the building built. Budgeting and estimating, it's a huge part of this process. Um, initially, you start out with parametric cost comparables. We find out what things cost in uh, Baltimore, uh, Denver, Minneapolis, and you compare it to your number of seats. And you start out there in a very broad way. Then you establish a budget goal and design to that budget goal. You develop a design concept that matches that, and you test the budget against the concept. And you're constantly doing this back and forth of testing. That's the early end of the project. This was all managed by my office as well, too. From there, assuming your budget matches your concept and your design, then you move to schematic design, design development, construction documents for the entire process. Again, a relatively involved process. You test the budget at each phase. You make sure that you're not straying. The last thing you want to find out is that a job you thought was going to be $300 million costs three fifty. That's the old Omni Hotel problem. Remember that from earlier in my career? I learned a lesson back then. Um, the Phillies have to approve each phase, and it's very important for the owner to say, yes, I agree with that, go forward. They can't be allowed to second guess later on. So a lot of my job is instilling discipline in the ownership side to make sure they know where they stand with various projects. Uh, you still have problems. You still over, uh, are over budget. You end up with uh, having to revise the design and value engineering to get back into budget. Uh, you bid out early packages and test the budget. As you uh, bid out packages, you have more certainty. You can reduce contingency. It makes for a healthier job. And then finally, you adjust your guaranteed maximum price based on all your budget input to make sure it matches your budget. Then you have a final contract value. The project challenges in this job were significant. <clears throat> um, we had land assembly problems. I'll talk about it in a few minutes with some pictures. Remember I pointed out to you in the uh, early uh, floor plan of the ballpark where the mechanical space was and the electrical space was? Well, we all know, uh, or you will learn this, okay, that you want those spaces in place physically first because they take the longest to finish. That's where all your equipment goes, piping, controls. It's a very protracted process. That's the heart of the building. When that's in place, then the rest of it is just extensions of that to bring services to buildings. It turns out that the two of the most difficult parcels to buy for Citizens Bank Park were in our mechanical and electric room. So we couldn't start the project there. We started the project at the opposite side of the ballpark, and that caused us problems later on. Uh, 10th Street, which is runs right, used to run right down the middle of the ballpark, had two 69 KVA uh, electric conduits running down it that served a substation in South Philadelphia. They had to be relocated before we could even start the work. Parking was a very difficult project. Once we started the new ballpark, we took about uh, 5,000 parking spaces out of play. That's very difficult to manage in a sports complex, so we had to deal with that. Contaminated soils. Every cubic centimeter of soil at that ballpark was contaminated. It was old uh, uh, refuse from incinerators. It had high degrees of chemicals in it, you know, uh, hazardous, you name it. So it would have cost a fortune to have that taken off site and remediated. Not only that, once we demolished the vet, we had a huge hole to fill up, and we would have had to bring in soil for that as well, too. So we came up with a, a very unique solution with the uh, environmental folks in Pennsylvania it worked out spectacularly well for the entire project. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, the water table I mentioned already, since it's 15 feet higher than the lowest level of the building, you have to create a system that will take that water away. That was a challenge. We met it uh, fairly well. Severe winter weather. We had a terrible winter right before we opened the ballpark. It really, really hurt us uh, in finishing the job. The Phillies had to be out of the vet <clears throat> in December prior to the ballpark opening and into the new ballpark in, in January, ready to do operations. So we had to get that part of the ballpark ready about three months ahead of time. That was difficult. The neighbors were difficult because neighbors can be difficult. You're building an enormous project in their backyard. You're demolishing a building in their backyard. Their committees have right to bring their grievances to you. So you've got to deal with them. And then finally, uh, the Phillies who had never built a project in their life all of a sudden had a $500 million project in Philadelphia and a $40 million project in Florida all happening simultaneously while they ran a Major League Baseball team. So at the end of the process, they liked this process better than baseball, frankly, but it was a 
real challenge for them as an organization. <clears throat> now some pictures of the ballpark. And so I think we're at the end of, of me uh, rambling on about the list of the names and numbers. This is December 2001. This is the start of construction of the ballpark. Uh, this is a general outline that you'll see. This is 10th Street going north. 10th Street, as I mentioned, had two uh, oil-filled 69 kVA conductors there fitting a substation that had to be relocated. This line here, that dark line, that's one of the lines that went to the west. This is the outline of the building basement for the ballpark, 10th Street. And these are the two warehouses I talked about. This is a Jetra warehouse and also a cold storage warehouse. By all rights, they should have come down first and been long gone. We couldn't clear that land deal until close to the opening of, of the uh, construction phase. So unfortunately, we had to reverse our operations and build the building entirely different than we had planned to begin with. It was, it was quite a challenge. Uh, March 2002, uh, here's the electric substation where those lines had to be rerouted to. They used to both go right down 10th Street. One went that way, one went that way. We had to intercept them on each side of the ballpark and run them all the way around into the substation. That's oil-filled conduits, which you may or may not know about, are each custom made. There's only two or three manufacturers in the world that do it. They've got to be measured precisely based on the pathway. It's not an easy process. The relocation of those oil-filled conductors started that year before we started the ballpark. That's the advanced planning you've got to do. That's part of project management, finding out those issues. And here what you see now is the, the general outline of the building. This is that same path I showed you previously. This is sheeting and shoring, beginning excavation, following the path of the ballpark. And we're generally going to move in a counterclockwise uh, path to build the ballpark. The right way to build this ballpark was clockwise. So we're already starting in the hole. This is where my offices were up there. That's the, uh, an old Maggio cheese warehouse. I had an office in a, a cheese refrigerator. Um, and this became the contractor's uh, uh, trailer yard. And every one of these ballpark uh, uh, parking lots, we rebuilt all during the process of this, for this project. August 2002, a little more like a ballpark. <clears throat> Eagles practice bubble out there. We had to get rid of it eventually. Now you see a little bit of familiarity with ballparks, a little bit of rakers there holding uh, little hold seats eventually right underneath the scoreboard. This is a couple of uh, foundation walls. That's that utility corridor I told you about that was good for the looping of utilities. And you see the outline of the building and these foundation walls progressing around the building. The progress here is structure on top of pile caps, on top of piles that are being driven in advance. So the actual construction is piles, pile caps, structure, and then uh, vertical from there, and then steel from there. <clears throat> September, this was August, this was next month. You get a feel for how rapidly this is moving now, and it's not moving rapidly enough, I hate to tell you, okay? This is a very, a lot of hand wringing happening here. Uh, again, you can see what I talked about earlier, uh, piles being driven here, not a whole lot more being done there in the course of the last 30 days. This has progressed some here, but generally you had to keep that flow going and, they, and we lost the bubble on that. Constant excavation, constant moving materials, big mountain of excavated materials here because it was convenient to put it there. October, one month later, okay, you're starting to see more of a ballpark. You're starting to see uh, slab on grade, uh, grade beams on top of, of uh, pile caps here, more of the lower bowl. This is the uh, scoreboard structure starting right now, structural steel. And again, pile caps all of a sudden, but still there's just generally not much happening on this side of the project. Um, you see excavation material still, still stacked up there. And the very beginnings of the building shells over here that are the more important parts of the building. Now, we talked about the soils. And so the issue with the soils was if everything's contaminated, how do you save money? How do you avoid shipping it off-site, remediating it, and then bringing back soil? Because when we demolished the vet, which is right here, the vet, uh, ideally held almost exactly the same volume of soil we needed to excavate Citizens Bank Park. So we worked with DEP in Pennsylvania and had this entire area declared one site, Navy Yard plus the ballpark. And what DEP allowed us to do was take soil from Citizens Bank Park, go down the street here, under 95, into the Navy Yard, through this road here, down an old runway, and deposit all the soils here. So as we excavated the ballpark, we moved every you know, cubic inch of soil down to the Navy Yard. And then once we were finished with the project, demolished the vet, had the vet volume to full uh, to uh, fill, it all came back from here, back up the same path, and filled this big hole here. 
So if you've been to the vet, and you may have noticed those parking lots are a little bit higher than the rest of the surrounding area. We miscalculated on some of the volumes. That's why they're a little bit higher. But this, it was still a great solution. But that was a, that cost trucking alone. So no remediation, no uh, moving contaminated soils elsewhere in the world. It stayed on site. Perfect solution for a, green, for a uh, brownfield. And this is the site over at the Navy Yard. It was the highest point in South Philadelphia for about a year and a half. That's the old seaplane hangar back there. The Delaware River's right beyond that. And we created a uh, enormous uh, uh, retention facility here for those contaminated soils, managed the rainwater runoff, treated that runoff, and distributed it uh, to the sewer system. Back on the job, just different, different points of view. Uh, this is the vet, obviously. Again, uh, earlier version of the ballpark. This is a large sump. And so once we turned our groundwater pumping off and allowed this, the groundwater to rise up again to 15 feet, it would have flooded the entire building in the playing field. And so to, to eliminate that, there were two levels of uh, water removal systems placed under the playing field. There was one system that intercepted water coming out from below, and that intercepted the groundwater. And when that was intercepted, it channeled that water to this large sump, which has a number of multi-stage pumps in there, they pumped that water up into the sewer system down to the Philadelphia treatment plant. We also had another level of uh, piping that was right below the playing field surface, probably about 15 inches below. That was there to intercept rainwater. And major league playing fields are meant to take 10 inches of rain an hour and be playable immediately thereafter. And so in order to conduct that kind of a volume across, you have large 8, 10, and 12 inch pipes that crisscross the entire field to take that water away. So on top you have the rainwater removal. Below you had the groundwater removal, and that joint system worked together to keep this space dry. The vet has the same problem. They have a large sump over there. The one problem with the vet is their pumps weren't on emergency power. So if they lost power in a storm event, they had to bring the fire engines from the uh, Philadelphia Fire Department down there to pump out their sump and spill it on the ground to make sure that the entire uh, ballpark didn't get flooded. Here, this sump and all these stage pumps are on emergency power. This is the sump. So this is where all the water, intercepted groundwater and rainwater came before it was pumped out to go down to the uh, water treatment plant. Um, another picture of the building just a little bit further along. You see the structure there, scoreboard structure in place, very little structure beyond that. Now this is uh, November, okay, remember we're going to open up in uh, April of 2004, so a little over a year now. I don't see much ballpark there, okay. but again, what are you going to do, run around and I can't pull my hair out, that's already been done. So you got to get people together and say, how do we solve these problems? How do you manage this project to mitigate this problem? So we work with Clark and Hunt fairly closely to try and accelerate their schedules. February 22nd, 2003, uh, just slightly over a year before the ballpark had to be finished and open for playing ball. Very discouraging, okay? The structure's only commenced and it's progressed probably to this point here. You still see we have a tremendous amount of concrete structure not in place, frozen ground. It was a nightmare. It was a very bad winter. May 28, 2003, opening day, remember, is uh, the middle of April. So we have 11 months to go. And people were panicking at this point. So you, cannot, you can never let panic take over a job because panic becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy. All right? Once you say you're not going to finish, you don't finish. In this situation, we were going to finish. And we did it. So everyone on the project, Phillies, contractors, laborers, everybody was dedicated to finishing this job. Uh, this is May, June. And you see a lot of progress between May and June. A lot of structure down the line over here. A lot more looking like a ballpark. It's still a mess. It still was a, a chaotic scene. July, more ballpark. Uh, remember, this building here is going to be for the Phillies to move into at the end of the year. And even better, uh, when you do a major league ballpark with natural turf, the, the uh, field has to be in by the fall of the previous year to be able to grow in during the growing season and go dormant so it's ready to go in the springtime. So we had to get from July to say September and have this be available for a field to be put down, including all the underfield drainage I talked about, those two layers, plus the, uh, the sand root zone and the turf itself. Now the turf's being grown somewhere else, so that's not a problem. It's getting in here and putting it down. August, you're looking more like a ballpark. Now, one thing I wanted, I, I meant to point out to you, when you erect a ballpark, the distances from the field to the furthest pick for the crane 
are not uh, within normal crane's reach, okay? And these crawler cranes have a limited reach before they lose their capacity. And so generally, when you erect a ballpark or a sports facility, you make one pass and erect all the upper precast, you go back in and make another pass and erect the lower precast. And so these cranes here, these crawlers, are crawling around inside the bowl, erecting upper level precast and steel. We still haven't put in, you know, 30% of the seating, which is on the field level. Now you see what's happening in August. Again, remember, I want a field in there before the end of the growing season, right? I don't see any fields yet. This is the lower bowl starting to be laid in by these crawler cranes, once again moving counterclockwise around the site. Same situation. And you see now more of the ballpark. Seating tiers in place above, light towers in place, lights in place, buildings starting to shape up. Outside site work, which has to be done too, it's a mess. The last thing you want to do is site work in the wintertime. We're heading right into the wintertime. But that's what you're forced to do in jobs like this. Uh, September, very next month. Big difference, okay? 30 days later, you see we're into a rhythm now. And you're starting to see things shape up. You see the shape of the ball field. Generally, the cranes are just about out of there. This section is still rough out there. There's no seating in place here. But you, you begin to s take some heart in the shape of what's happening there. This is the building the Phillies will occupy, and I'll forget at the end of the year. It was a mess inside. Uh, this is uh, mostly vertical transportation with some minor offices. This is the concessions, and don't forget, electrical plant and mechanical plant over there, running way behind. Okay, now we're in October, and what do you see? You see playing field. And so what you, see, what you can see there is, see these vague uh, horizontal lines there? That's the upper level of the drainage that is used to intercept rainwater below the root zone in the actual area of the playing field. And so the way these go down is, uh, the drain lines go in first, and they spread this, this uh, sand, which is uh, right below the root zone. That's to make sure that the water travels freely through the surface at 10 inches per hour. And then they start identifying the infield. So they did the infield grass first, started to spread the clay, and then progressed throughout the rest of the ballpark as they could make their progress to the ballpark. Again, Philly's office is here, two months before being used. This was a empty lot a month ago, sorry, right there. It's now a parking garage. Right, that's a precast parking garage for Philly staff and players. There's a tunnel from there right into the clubhouses. Again, it's a mess outside, but you see a baseball field and the stadium starting to shape up. November 30th, okay? Everybody started to feel a little better here. Uh, the Phillies still weren't in the office, but you started to see a field down. When that field went down, the entire project stopped. Everybody in the ballpark looked at that, and they knew they were working on something that they felt was a, was a mission. We had to get this ready for the, for the players. Now, I will tell you, notwithstanding the Eagles fans, who did everything in the possible in their control to prevent us from finishing the ballpark. Uh, I've been telling too many stories today, but uh, who's been to an Eagles game here? Okay, they, they can be quite the, you know, event. So, uh, the, I was at my office one night uh, for a Monday night football game. I got invited to go see the game. I leave my office, which was in this building here, and look down to the south to the uh, parking lots the Eagles use. Huge ball of fire. There's, there's, a, there's an RV and eight cars in a circle in flames blowing up in the parking lot. And of course, it's filled up. so people all standing around, you know, laughing at it. But um, <laughs> it turns out, and if you've, if you've been to a tailgate at the Eagles games, it, you go there at 6 a.m. in the morning and drink all day. It's even worse for a night game. Then you go into the ball game. And so the guys who rented this RV had been drinking from 6 a.m., had a charcoal grill outside, were cooking all day long. Game time, they packed up, put the grill inside the trailer, went into the game. So unfortunately, the grill was still hot and the coals were still in there. And so the trailer kind of spontaneously combusted at some point and engulfed all the cars around it. And so it was, you know, quite the treat. Now, believe it or not, the Phillies got sued over that because our hydrants weren't active at the time in the parking lot. So. But, you know, no good deed goes unturned. But another point was, in one, one of the winter games, I had a landscape manager working for me. She came in on a Monday, and she said, uh, all of our trees are gone on 10th Street. So we had, we had uh, $30,000 worth of trees lining both sides of uh, 10th Street. And I said, they, they can't be gone. So she goes out there and looks at it. Every one of the trees was sawed off at the tree grate, and they were all burned in barrels by the Eagles fans the previous Sunday. But that's just the cost of doing business. One of, the, one of the games after this field went down was a Sunday game, a noon game. I get a call from the security guard. There's people on the field. Well, th what the hell? Who's on the field, OK? So it turns out Eagles fans were curious about the ballpark. They went inside and started cutting 
swaths of turf off the field to take home with them to put into their lawns. So we had, you know, two by three sections, one by five sections cut out all over the field before the security guys could stop them. So that's just what happens when you build an attractive facility people want to get involved in and take a piece home. Who knows how many seats we lost? You could seats come in boxes with rise, you know, different elements. They took pieces of those, took those home. It was an interesting process. Now, so I'll leave you there. This is essentially, this is in March. So that's the finished ballpark there. Of course, it had to snow again. So this is probably, I want to say, a month before we opened the ballpark. And so one of our missions was to demolish the vet, a separate project. Um, and so early on, we uh, made this a separate project and bought in. There's only a couple firms in the country that do this kind of implosions. And so working with a local design firm and this implosion company, they rigged this building to be brought down by implosion prior to the ballpark being opened. And so in mid-March or so, uh, this was imploded. And they did it in a, a fairly artistic way. I mean, they could have, uh, and all this, if you're familiar with this type of operation, it's a matter of delayed explosive charge in the right place, in the right force to just knock out the structural integrity and the building collapses of its own weight. It's pretty fascinating. They must have put in 20,000 charges into various elements of this building to bring it down, all staged progressively. And what they did was they started this gap right here, and then they did each bent progressively. So the building took about maybe a minute and a half to go down in its entirety flat on the ground. If you, have, if you want to look at uh, YouTube and dial up uh, the uh, vet demolition, there's some great videos on there that show exactly how it happened. So immediately after that happening, this is what we had left over. And so the job we had to do then was to go through there and demolish that, crush all that concrete, get it off site, bring all the contaminated soils back to the Navy Yard, fill it up, level it off, and then put parking lots there. Now that took another year after the building opened, but in the meantime we had parking all around the building. And you can still see, as far as nail biting goes, this street here, this street here, all had to be open for opening day. It's less than 30 days away and they weren't done. But that all got done. And that's, that's the way the projects go. So uh, all in all, this was a, a great project to be involved in. And, and rather than, you know, I, I, we talked a lot about uh, earlier about learning as you go. This is, you know, what happened to me. You know, I started out doing uh, terrible jobs in the Navy and, and jobs didn't work in first jobs in civilian life. And all of a sudden, I'm managing an entire project like this. It didn't happen overnight. You learn something every day and that's how you become adept at things like this. And one of the, the, the more critical tools I have is you just can't get excited, right? And things happen and you're there to fix these things. And so running around with your hair on fire does nothing but excite people. Right? You want people focused to tell you what has to be done, when it has to be done, and get it done. So this is Citizens Bank Park now. It's a, it's a relatively uh, uh, recent picture, actually. Uh, that, that was my offices there. That's still in place. Uh, this is where all the, that's the uh, substation where the oil field conductors terminated. This is parking, this is all parking now. Streets are all modern, this is a, a great bar to go to. And uh, generally it's been a very successful building for the Phillies, they're very happy. And they did this out of a textbook. They uh, uh, for years have been much maligned here and had not been a winner. They invested money in people, they borrowed money, uh, they invested money in a ballpark. That investment paid off with more revenues, more revenues bought better players. Better players may won more games and ultimately a World Series. So it's just, it was a great experience to be involved in. Um, so it was a, a really a super project for me. It was just a, I've seen it happen in other places, but never as well as that. So that's the, uh, the extent of what I had to say. Sorry, that's not so bad, but uh, in any event, I apologize for taking so long. But uh, the message here for you is that, uh, you know, you have a lot of time ahead of you to understand how the processes work in project management, engineering. Nothing's going to come overnight. Take your time, ask questions. Don't be afraid to be wrong, because you will be. Uh, hope you have understanding bosses. Look for mentors that can teach you things. And then be quiet and speak up when you think you should. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this, this afternoon. Sorry it took so long. I'll take any questions that you have.